Joseph Beryl was a young American soldier who fought the Wehrmacht in two different uniforms during World War II. The so-called hero of two armies served as an elite paratrooper for the legendary 101st Airborne Division. He was then captured by the Germans, and after several failed attempts to escape, he finally did it in early 1945. Soon after, he became a tanker in the 1st Guards Tank Brigade of the Soviet Army. Besides becoming the only American that fought under the flag of the Red Army, Beryl also met unique personalities during his adventures, such as the only female Soviet tank commander, Alexandra Samosenko, and even Marshal Georgi Zhukov. Since then, Joseph Beryl's story has been promoted by the United States and Russia as a symbol of unity, peace, and cooperation between both countries. A Talented Lad Joseph Beryl was born in Muskegon, Michigan in 1923. He was the third of seven children born to William and Elizabeth Beryl. His family came of German descent, and Joe learned to speak German since he was young. He was six years old when the Great Depression hit, and his father, a factory worker, lost his job. The family of nine was subsequently evicted from their home, resorting to one of Joe's grandmothers for shelter. His two eldest brothers dropped out of school to help the family stay afloat and joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, a work relief program for unemployed, unmarried men ages 18 to 28. Young Joe, who often accompanied his father to government food lines, decided to help support the family too, and he took a job at a barber shop as a sweeper. Moved by his actions, Joe's parents decided to keep him at school so he could earn a diploma and strive for a better future. Joe proved to be an excellent student and athlete, excelling at baseball and other sports. The young man could run a mile in less than five minutes, which caught the attention of college recruiters. By the time he finished high school in 1942, Joe was offered a full scholarship to play baseball at the University of Notre Dame. But Joe had other plans in mind. He wanted to join the war effort. The United States was now at war with the Empire of Japan. The Battle of Midway was underway, and the country was preparing to send men to the Pacific, Africa, and Europe. Joe had previously seen a recruitment poster of a paratrooper diving into the unknown that read, Jump into the Fight. Intrigued, he turned down the scholarship and enlisted in the army as a paratrooper. He was in for quite an adventure. Jumping Joe When he graduated basic training at Camp Custer in Michigan, Joe was assigned to the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles. He was then sent to Camp Tekoa, Georgia, where the real paratrooper training began. Joe specialized in radio communications and demolitions. The men of the 506th became known as the Kurahis, a Cherokee word given to a mountain where the training happened. It meant, we are alone. Joe's unit had to march 30 miles every time they practiced airdrops aboard Douglas C-39 and C-47 aircraft. It was during this time that he earned the nickname Jumpin' Joe. Joe's son, Jack, would eventually recall about his father's name, quote, A lot of the guys were afraid they would sprain an ankle or break a shin bone before a mission. As they got closer to the jump, they would actually give my father five dollars to show up and make the jump in their name. So he made many jumps under assumed names during training. Then somebody came up with the name Jumpin' Joe. In 1943, after almost a year of training, the 506 was sent to England to prepare for the Allied invasion of Europe. Ramsbury became the home of the Screaming Eagles for the next nine months. Joe was eager to get into action, and in April of 1944, he volunteered for several perilous operations behind enemy lines to support the Allied resistance in German-occupied France. Now a staff sergeant, Joe Beryl and two other members of the 506th were once tasked with delivering gold to French freedom fighters. After fulfilling their mission in the French countryside with their backpacks full of gold, the Americans were sheltered by the locals and sent back to England in a boat. Joe had completed two successful secret missions when the Allies were finally ready for the invasion of Normandy. The 101st would spearhead the attack, and Jumpin' Joe was one of them. An escape after another. In the morning of June 6, 1944, hours before the landings at Normandy, American and British paratroopers were thrown behind enemy lines to blow up power supplies, bridges, and other objectives that would disrupt the German line of defense. Joe's C-47 was shot down near the coast by German anti-aircraft guns, and he was forced to jump from a very low altitude of 360 feet. His parachute barely opened on time, and Sergeant Barrow landed in the Church of saint Comer du mont on his own. Although Joe was not able to link up with the scattered paratroopers of the 506th, he managed to sneak up to a power station and a bridge and blew them both out. Unfortunately, while trying to avoid contact with the Panzer Grenadiers, Jumpin' Joe crawled through the wrong hole and found himself standing in the middle of an MG-42 pillbox. There was no way out. Joe was taken as a prisoner of war, and for the next seven months, he was constantly moved from different camps that took him deeper into France. In a first attempt to escape, 
Joe took advantage of an Allied bombing targeting his camp. He was hurt by shrapnel, but managed to evade enemy forces for a day until he was captured. During a second attempt, the truck transporting him and other prisoners was strafed by friendly fire. Amidst the confusion, Joe and other paratroopers ran towards a train they believed was headed for Poland. They boarded it and sought to link up with Soviet forces to continue the fight. But as the train finally stopped, the young paratroopers were surprised to discover that they were not in Poland, but in the heart of Berlin. Jumpin' Joe was then taken and tortured by the Gestapo, which believed he was a spy. Joe would later write, quote, I was interrogated 20 to 24 hours a day. They were trying to get all the usual questions answered. Why me, a German, was I fighting for the Jews, Roosevelt, and Morgenthau against my own people? Sometime during the questioning, I called a German officer in SOB and woke up several days later in a hospital with a big headache and a bashed head, and later I was taken back to the monastery. Luckily, German army officers intervened before the Gestapo was about to shoot him. They took him in because the police had no jurisdiction over prisoners of war. By September of 1944, Joe was taken to the Stolag 3C POW camp in Altrewitz, Poland. He immediately began plotting his escape. By early January, Joe and three other prisoners finally broke out. His friends were gunned down by the enemies while running in the freezing cold, but Sergeant Joe was able to cross a river while German shepherds hunted him. Joe survived the cold weather while soaking wet. After walking for hours through desolated terrain, he finally heard the noises of tanks and men marching. The Soviets were approaching. He was saved. Amerikanski Tovarish Upon finding a Red Army tank brigade, Joe took out an old pack of Lucky Strike cigarettes and shouted at them in Russian, quote, Amerikanski Tovarish, which translated to American Ally. A commissar who spoke a little English took him in. Joe told him he wanted to join them and fight Hitler. The Soviets hesitated, but the battalion's commander took him in. It was Alexandra Samusenko, the only female tank officer who served in World War II. Joe then became a tanker in the First Guards Tank Brigade of the Soviet Army and eventually liberated the POW camp from which he had escaped. Joe kept fighting alongside the Soviets until he was wounded upon approaching Berlin. He was sent to a Soviet field hospital in Landsberg to recover, where he received the visit of Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the rising Soviet hero. Zhukov was intrigued by the presence of a non-Soviet in the region and wanted to get to know him. Joe later recalled, quote, Marshal Zhukov visited the hospital and he came to my bed and through an interpreter wanted to know my name and how I got there. And the last thing he said, is there anything I can do for you? Jumpin' Joe asked him for help to return to his men, but he had nothing to prove that he was American. Still, the next day, the interpreter gave him official papers to rejoin his forces. Joe was then sent to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, where he learned that the U.S. Army had considered him killed in action back in 1944. Even a funeral mass in his honor took place in Muskegon. After a long wait, Joe was finally cleared to travel back to Michigan in April of 1945. Legacy Joe's military legacy would continue as his eldest son served in the 101st as a paratrooper during the Vietnam War, and his younger son served as an ambassador to Russia between 2008 and 2012. Joe was also honored in 1994 by Presidents Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin at a special ceremony in the Rose Garden of the White House to commemorate the 50th anniversary of D-Day. After his service in World War II, he became a symbol of unity and cooperation between the U.S. and Russia. Joe died in 2004 and was buried with honors at Arlington National Cemetery. A plaque in his honor can be found in saint comme du mont France. Hillary Clinton once said of him, quote, Joseph Beryl's story is full of true heroism and represents a separate chapter in the closely intertwined history of our two nations. His sense of duty to his country and his respect towards allies and the sacrifices made by all will live on as a testament to future generations. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And tell us in the comments below your thoughts on Joe Barrell's incredible story.